Hello, my name is Weston Hecker. I'm going to be doing a talk here on a goodbye memory uh, scraping malware. So it's basically, I'll go over the talk here in great detail about some of the software. It's an open source project for proof of concept. So I'm not here plugging any kind of software. It's a proof of concept. Uh, the source code will be out there. We're doing a DEF CON launch. We had uh, trouble with internet connectivity, as uh, many of you will know. So uh, we were going to load the load everything up there. You guys will be able to play around with it. So uh, yeah, I work for a company, KLJ. It's an engineering company up north. So these are not the ref uh, the views of my employer. So yeah, uh, who am I? What's this talk about? Uh, I spoke at DEFCON 22. I have a lot of computer certifications. I went for computer science and uh, geophysics. So I've done uh, pen testing professionally about 11 years. Uh, I do a lot of security research uh, in malware, things like that. So I uh, spoke at DEFCON 22 last year on uh, burner phone DDoS. Did anybody check that out? Yeah. <laughs> that was good times. So uh, yeah. Uh, we do a lot of auditing. I know lots of, I've read so many manuals, it's not even funny. So, wrote custom exploits for a lot of uh, obscure ISP gear. It's something that's neglected. A lot of people, when they write exploits, they go for a lot of the, you know, 50,000 units, 500,000 units. So, it's nice to be able to have, uh, yeah, some exploits for some of the more obscure gear. So, there's a lot of people, anybody here do pen testing for a living or? Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really hard to find some of the exploits for some of the more obscure gear. So it's nice to have a community going. And if anybody has any questions about that, they feel free to shoot out uh, information for contact later on. So, and uh, the so software I'm going over today, it's a, a, it was myself and a co-writer, uh, Tim Swartz. He works with me. It was a concept that we came up with because we got sick of hearing of breaches in the news. So, and it's something that I think if it was implemented correctly, it could definitely stop a lot of the breaches. So, and uh, like I said, the source code will be loaded on GitHub later today. Um, yeah. Everything in the, as far as pen testing goes, banks, hospitals, you name it. So, and uh, actually, I got off my talk last year, we got a DHS contract over the next three years to attack 911 centers. So, that is very good times to be had. So, and here we go. Uh, uh, I did a variant on last year's ones. Uh, if you guys do pen testing and you like rubber duckies, this is an amazing thing. Uh, it's actually, they have TINC 3.0s. They are actual fake phone enclosures. I can teach you guys how to make them. They're amazing for pen tests. I started out with the iPhone 5s and I got sick of uh, converting them over to the 5 pins, so now I rock an HTC uh, or any Android handset for that matter. And uh, they're little Tinsy 3.0s. It basically tricks it into thinking it's a keyboard. You can do drive by attacks. You can run stuff. It's very, very cool stuff. If you guys have any questions, want to know how to build one, let me know. And I'm going to get the demo started here just so uh, we can see how it goes as it progresses. So I'll exit out of the slides here for one moment. You have to stand up for this. Here you go. So, is any oh, is anybody familiar with uh, point of sale skimming software and done any research on it or seen any other demonstrations? Yeah, this this basically is a Jack POS. The only reason I used it is it's a Black POS variant, so it's very very graphically uh, nice to view. So, and uh, I actually have a command version of. Uh, so you'll be able to see all the console injection. So I actually slowed it down. It normally injects 500 cards per second into memory. It basically feeds the malware fake credit card numbers. And I'm going to show a little demonstration. The actual, uh, this is not set up like a normal environment. Normally the POS does not have where the malicious data is being sent to on the same system. It's just for demonstration purposes. And I'm sure everybody already knew that, but I had to get that out there from when I was uh, telling somebody else about it. So, so basically, uh, this is the actual place where the d uh, fake or the credit card numbers are sent. So all the stolen credit card information will be sent by post requests from the point of sale system to a server. But in this instance, they're both of them. So, and it's going to go over the dumps. Uh, it looks like we have 3,100 track data already. So, yeah, the resolution's a little bit bad on that, but yeah. So these are basically track one and track two data. This is where they start putting it into credit card dumps on forms. And uh, they find out their validity rates. They'll do tests, stuff like that. And then this is the point where the bad guy would start selling it. And I'm actually going to show, go next into the actual software and what it's doing. So, oh, and here's the actual installer. This is the console version. It's graphically pretty. It looks like you know Matrix stuff sliding down. So, and uh, the graphic version, it is a full-blown application you can install and you can modify. It does have source code. But as you can see right now, it's injecting track one and track two data along with uh, randomly generated names, randomly generated bins, which are bank identification numbers. I'm North Dakotan, so we have special bins up in, you know, that designate I'm a North Dakotan. So that's basically what it's going to do is uh, generate the bins off of where the point of sale system is. So they look like valid credit card numbers. Um, there are no open source bin lists, 
So at this time, we're basically just injecting, um, yeah, we're just injecting randomly generated credit card numbers. So I'll go back to the slides here. And that, that uh, desktop is just one of our engagement photos. There's nothing strange going on there. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that you would see that. So <laughs> here, I'll go back over to my slides. One second. Okay. And we'll go to the second slide or third slide here. Well, we all speak it here, and it's basically a uh, source will be on GitHub here pretty soon. So it is open source. Once again, I'm not trying to plug anything. This is just proof of concept. I think uh, we're working on building it into some PMS property management software and POS software. Uh, it is something that I don't see why it wouldn't be in every single system eventually. So, and uh, the problems of Davis skimming, it's gotten large over the last few years. You literally can't turn on the news without hearing of a breach. So, it's gotten a, a little bit ridiculous over the years, and that's kind of the reason that uh, my, Tim and myself came up with the software. And yeah, why do people skim data? Uh, <laughs> I think they're pretty obvious. Uh, and <laughs> how much does it cost? Uh, some of the credit cards, like uh, validity rates, when they're very, very low, which means uh, you know nine out of ten will work type situation. The nine out of ten cards are about forty-five dollars a piece, and off of the bins, you can tell how much you could put on them. This is what nefarious people do when they're uh, they're people who literally drive around the United States just buying MacBook Pros. And selling them or whatever. That's that's basically where this industry comes. And in. uh, with some of the Carter forms, they're actually able to filter filter by the bins and things uh, recently, which has made it a lot, lot dan more dangerous. Because say, for example, somebody's trying to use my card down in Texas or using a North Dakota bin, I'm going to get a call on my cell phone, and they're going to be like, "Hey, did you try to do this?" They'll block it. So that's why it's scary that people are actually able to filter by bins. And that's something that it's nice to be able to actually have more look uh, more valid looking generated credit card data. So. And how much does it cost? As you can see, like uh, some of these ones are, uh, yeah, four and a half dollars up to I, I think the highest one. I have a script that uh, does analytics for the data and how the validity rates go down and it affects the price. But it actually uh, anywhere from four, I've seen three dollars down up to forty, one hundred and fifty for some of them for the really big ones. So, and yeah, it's basically goes a little bit into what it costs and uh, how is it used to defraud? Uh, does anybody in here have an MSR six hundred five or a two? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Amazon, exactly. They are very, very easily obtainable. And that's one of the things, like, whenever I was telling people about, you know, they'd ask about some software or whatever, and I was like, yeah, it's very, very simple. There are tons of people that are going out and doing this stuff. I'm not endorsing that. I'm just letting people know that that's how scary the actual MagStrip data and the environment of MagStrip is. So, and that's what I'm saying. Like, literally, people will buy these track one and track two days at the right amount of cards. Five minutes later, they're either in an ATM or inside of a a store actually doing fraudulent purposes. So, or they, yeah, there, people order things online. There's tons of things. If you're interested in that stuff, you can go into, uh, there's tons of, in, uh, for a very long time, there's been lots of information out about how people do the carding stuff if it's something of interest. So, so how is it used to defraud? So, like I was saying, ca uh, carding or ordering things, there's tons of things that people, you know, can see as valid online. So, like, uh, Actually, ordering things online, they'll order them to dead houses. So these things, they do try to stay, uh, keep them anonymous. Duplicating cards and using them in stores. That's one of the biggest retail thefts. Uh, the card not present stuff is not as big anymore. Uh, ATM cash outruns. People will literally, you know, get a bunch of homeless people, feed them for the day, and then they'll run them around to ATM machines. <laughs> so it's kind of scary. And then the theft of resources, gas. I've seen where some guy had like a 600 gallon tank attached to his truck. And yeah, it's. <laughs> it's crazy some of the extents that people go to. Uh, theft of online services, you know, such as your internet connection for $9.99. I don't know which one's more embarrassing that I went into Kmart to take a picture of that or if it's <laughs> that that still exists. So, <laughs> yeah, so they have uh, yeah, digital movies, digital sales. I know a lot of stuff that's really expensive, like some of the training courses uh, that have been leaked online lately. Yeah, they're, oh, yeah, we got watermarks on it. It doesn't matter because it was purchased with a fraudulent card. You know what I mean? So that stuff's kind of scary, and it's hard to track that down, and it defeats a lot of the DRM that they're using. So, yeah, and basically people can use cards to you do Western Union transfers, things like that. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. It's if you've never looked at the dark side of the internet, it's definitely interesting to take some looks at it. And yeah, and how, how are the batches actually exfiltrated? Is something I get a question about all the time. And uh, like for example, this is in the uh, for four bitcoins, you can get the version two of I believe that one's Dexter. And Dexter is one of the many POSs uh, mal or POS uh, malform that actually goes through and steals the credit card information. The difference between Dexter and some of the other variants is this one actually has a keystroke catcher. 
because most of them ag card readers are actually USB devices, USB keyboards, and I do have uh, a portion that I'll go over with uh, anti keystroke catching that works in more than just credit card environments. So, and yeah, so basically, you know, for four bitcoins, people can go out and buy this software. That's kind of ridiculous because I, mean, I guess that's pretty expensive now, but for about a thousand bucks, people, you know, after they actually steal it or hi hack a system, they can have the host and the server portions running pretty quick and they'll be stealing data. So that's actually how it gets loaded on. So, so people, yeah, like people ask how it gets loaded on. It's obvious any way that a computer is breached in any of the classic ways, as I would call them, you know, USB devices, uh, people are using Spearfish campaigns. So any compromised system, they'll, you know, they'll work their way and pivot point into the actual point of sale systems. They're pretty easy to tell a lot of the systems. They're, a lot of them are running deprecated software, things like that. So, and, uh, yeah, the basically the po it sends post requests and post requests are basically what are sent to servers. So that's how it's exfiltrating data and some of them actually store it on hand and then exfiltrate or they exfiltrate the files after they have like a gig's worth or you know 25 megabytes worth of data. So they do have ones that store them locally but a majority of them actually send them out in encrypted HTML uh, post requests. So it's not like something that people can network monitor. Uh, this software does actually generate uh, 600 times the traffic if you're doing po the post request method. So that is something. Yeah, you can't see if they are stolen credit card data, but a point of sale system starts doing 25 megabytes of data when it was doing uh, about a half a meg a bit ago. You definitely got something, and it's something that it's very, very useful for uh, intrusion detection also, and getting your intrusion detection to work better. So it's amazing, like the amount of data. I couldn't believe uh, how uh, actually clean it runs. It's actually when it idles, it's under one percent of the CPU utilization. So uh, for running, and that's injecting a thousand credit cards a second. So. And that's into memory. There is stability with it. You can inject it into any 32 or 64 bit process. So when it goes around and steals and looks for credit card data, it's going to come across a lot of uh, cards. So, and it's, I will go here. And yeah, it's like the two year old target, or it's probably three year old now, but it still has a validity rate of 10%. And that's just crazy to think that. So that's what I'm saying. Like a lot of this, I'll go into the actual, it's down to like 0 0.004 after you run some of these batches. So. And that's what I'm saying, they're being compiled into bins. That's the thing that really scares me and it actually, you know, has shot theft through the roof. So. So the initial, yeah, terminal is breached. It's loaded with malware. It's a bad person loads it onto the actual point of sale server. And then it basically sends it off to the server using the post requests or they pull the data through the FTP. Uh, I've seen incremental backups that, uh, <laughs> they're, they're finding very, very tricky ways to actually exfiltrate the credit or stolen credit card data and other data. So. Yeah, so basically after it's stored uh, on the POS, it's sent off to the server. And in this, I just wanted to stress again, in this demonstration it is all running on the same box. So it is basically sending to 127. It's sending to its home address. So, yep, and it's basically catching it. Um, yeah, that's for the most part. So that's, it's very good for this demonstration because uh, internet connectivity is very shoddy. I've had demos blow up in the past. So especially when you, it involves virtual machines and uh, unplugged laptops, it usually shuts one of the CPUs off. So that's why I've gone with the video version of the demo. So. And how does it tell uh, credit card data from uh, other data, They're just random numbers in there? And there's usually, uh, a lot of them have custom algorithms. Some of them go off of the basic LUN algorithm, which where with the check digit, it actually is mathematically able to detect what is a credit card number. And the first few numbers are the actual uh, first six are the bank identification number. That'll tell you if it's a Houston bank or a uh, Dickinson, North Dakota, Bismarck, you know, Minneapolis number. You'll be able to tell those. And that's actually a way to protect your data if you're scared of, or if you've had a breach four times in a year, go up to Ketchikan, Alaska and get yourself a bank account and it'll never happen again. So, <laughs> or to Bismarck, North Dakota, there's like 600,000 of us. So, is anybody from North Dakota? Yep. Oh, awesome. Yep. <laughs> there's two of us. So, <laughs> Here we go. And uh, this is a little bit blown up. This is the actual malwares that we tested them against. Uh, Chewbacca, Jack POS, Dexter, Black POS, Backoff. Uh, there's a couple other ones that are definitely of Russian variants. Uh, Vskimmer, Brute POS. Uh, we tested it against all of them. Uh, and the actual um, only ones that we didn't were the, some of the versions of Dexter. Uh, they had some uh, keystroke catching that was a little bit harder to catch, but I have a Tinsy that actually does injections in, uh, there's a black hole on the actual software where you can inject keystrokes into. So it's pretty, pretty decent for blocking uh, just in general, anything like that. So, and then here, yeah, if does anybody do malware research? Yeah, you can definitely, uh, this is, an, that is another reason. 
if you're doing reverse engineering of point of sale skimming malware or you just want to play around with it. It's a very, very good way to actually get that malware alive and feed it. So, and uh, I've seen uh, where the actual ones where they dump, like Dexter, I actually locked up a computer because uh, I think it was making uh, 500 megabytes a day of data and we were just running it to make sure it wouldn't crash or anything and it's amazing how big some of those files get and how quick they get. So, so the approach, uh, the, like to stop the breaches, this is an open source software that I made, uh, or myself and Tim made, and we, uh, yeah, we just wanted to release it and see if people could use it, implement it into their own APIs uh, for some of their other software. So, and that's what I'm saying. There's no reason at all that uh, it's got an MIT license, so anybody can improve on it and uh, put it into pretty much anything. So that's something that's nice to be able to. I don't see any reason why the people wouldn't want to put it in. I know we're going into chip and pin, but I'm actually working on uh, methods and proof of concepts to make them actually implement chip and pin properly because there's a lot of people that aren't putting chip and pin to its fullest extent. So, and what currently exists, uh, there are some, for sk uh, skimming there's the f uh, classical firewalls that can manage packets, you can scan out, you can put snort rules, like there's lots of actual tools out there, firewalls, there's tons of uh, IDSs and things like that that'll look for specific things or look for signatures, but that's not enough with some of the stuff, it's especially uh, when you get into some of the honey potting features of it, it's nice to be able to know when you are breached and if you seed uh, there, there's some high availability uh, bins that you can actually paste in where they'll be almost guaranteed they look like a $15,000 Amex or something. They're definitely going to get grabbed first and you can actually seed those into your batches and those will get sold off first and you'll actually know a lot better when the breach happened and you'll, you know, there are other ways like where people can buy four of the credit cards and then they can run them through processors and things like that to actually tell where they're breached or who's breached and things like that. So, but yeah, as of right now I haven't ran into m many tools and if you guys do know of any tools that are made specifically for point of sale skimming or stopping said point of sale skimming, definitely fill me in. I love hearing about them. So, and how would this concept make batches usable? It's basically uh, you have valid credit card data that is being swiped in there. It's being sent to the credit processor, but where it's being stolen uh, is actually in memory. So this is a very, very, uh, for the most part, simple concept, and I'm surprised that not a lot of the bigger companies had come across it. Uh, basically, it injects 500 fake credit cards for every valid credit card number in memory. So when people steal them, they're actually exfiltrating tons of fake data. I tried scrubbing these. Somebody gave me a batch of 500, tried running them through a credit processor. Every, after 50 cards were run, had to do manual authorization on them. So there's no way that a person would be able to scrub these batches. They look valid. They have real names. They're generated off of, you know, 25,000 most common names in the United States. If you live in a more dominant Asian area or something like that, you can import and have uh, better names lists, things like that. And if you go off of uh, the bins lists, you can actually generate traffic. If you're in a touristy area, you can leave it open so it, there's credit cards from everywhere. And just statistically speaking, you're going to generate tons of where it, it won't matter. And that's what I'm saying. When people try to scrub these batches and try to sell them online, they're going to lose their reputation. And that's one of the biggest things. You know, the validity rates, 98%, people will gladly buy those all day long. 0 0.004, that's not going to happen. And that's kind of what the, it goes after is actually stopping people from doing the breaches uh, because there won't be any money to be had on it. So. Uh, yeah, how are they generated? Like I said, it's off of uh, basically a long algorithm and then we have a lit bins list and uh, it's not fully implemented because the bins list is sold and I was planning on making an open source bin list but I thought it would be used for nefarious things more than actually implemented in Skimbad. So, and it's open source so I would have had to leave the bins list. I couldn't have separate things compiled. Uh, bins lists are like $25,000 in some instances. So it is very, it's not affordable for, you know, a, a project such as this one. So. And that's something where it's the bank identification number, the first six numbers. The first one actually tells if it's a Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and then the rest of them are actual bin, or the actual bank and financial institutions. So, and how are the random cards made? Like I was saying, it, it basically generates them from scratch and then attaches a name to them and track one and two data. So they look like valid credit card numbers. I even throw valued customer or, you know what I mean, or gift card in there once in a while. So it's actually a very, very uh, good, good system of way of blocking it. And like I was saying, I, uh, pull the list off the social security webpage for the United States for first and last names and uh, yeah, basically generate it from scratch and yeah, we have a pretty good list of names to input and like I was saying, you can modify names and I was watching and my dad's name came across and it's like, it's, it's a good list. So there's, <laughs> there are some names that I was like, that is an awesome name. So some of them sound like vampire names, things like that. So <laughs> and this basically explains the honeypot services. These credit card numbers do not occur naturally. So it's something when, it, when a credit processor comes across them, uh, they were not ever issued. There's not actually a physical card. 
the card will come through the credit processor and they'll be able to tell that one was leased to, you know, so and so company. So I will notify them of the breach because like I was saying, some of those bins, they'll, they'll look like they're unlimited cards or they'll look like corporate cards which are ch not checked that often, things like that. So it would look like some of the lucrative $154 cards or it'll have, you know, information with it. So and that's what I'm saying, like when it's randomly generated, they'll, they'll also be padded around that. That's why I made those uh, actual honeypot cards. They look a lot better. So they're, and that's the, when you input them, there is a way to reverse the batches depending how you input yours. So I have uh, ways to actually fully remove once you seed your um, honeypot cards. So it's, it's a, little bit, a little bit of a lengthier process and it's not fully developed, but it is something that uh, it is possible. Uh, it's very easy to reverse is the only problem. But for the kind of people that are actually stealing credit card information, I think it would be a uh, coverage in most 70% of the situations. And uh, anti keystroke catching, that's something that's kind of fun. It's uh, actually plug it in with a little Tinsy and it'll inject uh, what looks like valid credit card numbers. It re repetitiously puts some of them in and just generates them from scratch. I didn't have enough uh, processing power to do full uh, skim bad type situation, but it will uh, fill up whatever, uh, the, the ones that have skim, or the, excuse me, the ones that are actually uh, capturing data and pulling them locally are also the ones that happen to have functionality with keystroke catching for the most part. So that's something where it actually can inject from scratch uh, some of the keystrokes. So, and it'll fill those logs up very, very quick. Most IDSs will detect a log that's growing 500 megabytes with uh, what looks like null input on it. So. And how will I stop? Uh, uh, how will malware evolve and how can we, you know, stay on top of this? Like obviously, you know, people are going to try to attack, you know, skim bad if it would get out in the wild, be getting used, things like that. So we did build some watchdogs, some very simple ones to start everybody out with. And they'll, oh, let's just, you know, only read the memory of the point of sale system. And uh, if it's 32 or 64 bit, you can just directly inject into the POS or the point of sale software. And it doesn't affect how it goes to the credit processor either. That's one, another big question I always get. So. Uh, yeah, how will it evolve? It's definitely gonna, uh, you know, they're gonna get smarter about it. They're gonna have to uh, take a little bit step forward. Uh, I know all, most of the malware that I've been coming across when they always bust, you know, some 17 year old Eastern European guy, it's like, I don't know, it's like you think that they would have had somebody more behind it and they always make it sound like it's a dangerous persistent threat, but it, it's simple to stop it. There are a lot of very, very good development tools and things like that, but it's something that if, if we stay on one step ahead, it's, and another thing is with it being open source, it's, they're able to see exactly what it does. So that's why a lot of the stuff, uh, when it installs, it actually randomizes it. So that's, that's pretty much the, I'm sure a lot of people have things coming to mind also of how people would, you know, try to stop this type of stuff. And that's, I love to hear that kind of stuff because that only makes the product that much better or you can even implement it yourself. So yeah. And it detects bins from certain areas. So say for example, if North Dakota, if there's a bunch of Florida bins, they'll try to scrub the batches and only, you know, do bins that are North Dakotan bins and it wouldn't work that way because of uh, just sheer amount of them. So, and not to mention I, when I did the credit processing, it, after 10 failed attempts, it does to make you manually authorize them and that would be uh, a lot of work to actually skim through those. So. And the watchdog portion, so I protect it from malware, uh, basically, so when it stops the process, unless if they have something specifically made to attack uh, Skimbad, it would be pretty hard to stop it. It, it in itself, it's, uh, it's not, not necessarily a rootkit, but it does have some protection uh, from, it does restart itself when it stops, it's very, very simple. Uh, that's the last thing I want is to have a, a virus signature on the actual uh, anti-software, so that's something where I did uh, skim a, skim a round on it and it's something that uh, that's something that people can implement and if it's implemented, you know, into uh, another product, it's, it would be very simple. Like uh, there's a lot of AV companies that have very, very hard to kill watchdogs, so. And yeah, basically how does the batch look real? Uh, they are all valid, or for the most part they're, they're valid bins and there are tons of not invalid bins because like I was saying I didn't want to load the bins lists because, uh, and I don't want people to have to pay even a dime for it. So that's something where it literally, as you can see there, it, it fills just with random data, so or not random data, but they are uh, credit card passing data. So yeah, so there, it's just the sheer mass and volume of it is what makes it inherently protected. So yeah. And so basically, yeah, when they're sent off, they're grabbing the fake ones right along with the real ones. So, and there are, uh, I've tried ways to cross check it. And if anybody can come up with ways, love hearing them, would love to improve it. So and how to reverse the batches, like I was saying, uh, it was blocked after I tried diff two of different auth authentication companies and yeah, they're blocked after 10, 10 attempts. So we try to run, otherwise people could just randomly generate credit cards and things like that and they'd be able to use it that way. So that is a mechanism that is working for actually scrubbing the batches. 
some of the other ways, and uh, you know, people keep signing up for stuff using credit card, stolen credit card information to get authentication stuff, but it's, yeah, it would just make it ridiculously hard. There would be several hundreds of hours, thousands of hours, it would literally make it not worth it, so. Yeah, so basically, when is, is chip and pin gonna stop it? Uh, for the most part, if it's set up correctly, uh, there are some replay attacks that I'm sure people have seen out in the wild. Uh, there's a couple guys out of England that did a replay attack locally in a store, and uh, I know that there, there are some, with the uh, chip and signature, that's the exact same as it's pretty much been in the past, so that's all about getting people to properly implement them and uh, getting it to roll forward, so. So I, I honestly don't think that it'll stop it until people properly implement it, so. And it is a software that is open source, it's free. Uh, people can help make it better. It does have all the source code out there. If it's something that you guys want to, you know, imp implement into something else or, you know, work, work through it, it's definitely something that uh, I would like to get a community behind it and help people build it up. And, yeah, I'm going to open it up to questions here in a little bit. Uh, I'm going to get the demo running in the background. I did transcode it at 480 <laughs> accidentally, so it is a little pixelated, but you guys will get the gist of it. And it's, it's amazing. It, it's, I did slow the demo down, as you can see. Uh, when it goes through the actual names list and stuff, it, uh, yeah, so I will run that through here. And here's all my contact information. If you guys have any questions or if you want to follow me on Twitter, I do appreciate that. And uh, if you ever want to build one of those Tinsy devices, those are really, really fun. And I definitely recommend them for people who do pen testing for a living. It's one step up from the USBs, so. So, and we open up to questions or, yeah? Yeah, they have the mic too. You're somewhere. Oh, sorry about that. Yes. <laughs> and that is my real name. That's not my handle. So that means uh, that is German for hacker. So there you guys go. Okay. Have you seen any uh, ability to actually modify that? To modify the track data? I mean, you can modify it, but where it actually gets accepted by the processor, the card didn't normally allow it. So all of a sudden, instead of getting a regular cash back, I'm going to say 20 million percent, you get a download. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen where uh, people can actually make them look like manual authorizations when they aren't. And that's a, uh, I know there's some people that ran some stuff through in Brazil. She was asking basically if you can modify the track data to make it look like chip and pin. Uh, is that correct what you're asking? Yeah. And that there are a couple uh, attacks that are like that if it is uh, improperly installed by the actual uh, vendor. So if the actual point of sale or the authentication is improperly set up, that is something that can be done. So sweet. Thank you. Did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. yeah there are a couple of attacks out there. They haven't released the details on them. So. And does anybody else have any other questions? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I was talking about. That's the that's the feedback I want. Like the uh, not only will I will will people myself and other people in the community port things over, you know, to other operating systems. Like this one, I, I made it for win work for Windows. It should work with a, a lot of the older libraries. 
So it is something that is not resource intensive. It literally utilizes less than 1% of a CPU and that's a 4 gigabyte VM with one core. So it was li literally a negligible amount and that was injecting ‑‑ does that answer your question for that one? Exactly. I <laughs> okay. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. Like s some of the things are ‑‑ you can be uh, tune them to be more efficient and uh, at 10, even 10 credit cards, I think it would be uh, very, very simple for the resources and yeah, and some of the logging, that's the next generation. That's the kind of stuff that I want the feedback on. Like this is literally just a proof of concept. I don't understand. And it covers most of those uh, malwares. Like that's literally the, the people who are trying to brute ‑‑ or just literally slapping them on 50 computers at a time, if they're targeted, yes. If they know they're running XPOS, yeah, they're going to be able to look at the source code. They're going to be able to look at certain other things and actually tune their malware to it. I'm not saying that. This is literally just a cover. If this would have been running on some of the POSs and the, the larger breaches, it definitely would have helped with it. The validity rates, they wouldn't have had to ‑‑ some of the people, the class action lawsuits would have been cut down because they wouldn't have had to cancel people's cards when they're in Belize on vacation. That's some of the things that, you know, people ended up suing for. So does that answer your question or ‑‑ Okay, awesome. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> uh, because uh, anything more than that, you're technically ‑‑ going to start covering in memory, especially on smaller POS systems. You're going to cover them in memory before you're act they're actually pulled by the scraping malware. You can do up to 60,000. <laughs> that's the highest I went in that. It would just be uh, counterintuitive. It wouldn't have any purpose to it. So that's why I st stayed with 500 uh, credit card numbers because it will start copying over itself. So does that answer your question? Excuse me? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can do it like uh, you can pretty much fine tune it. Uh, like I said, it, uh, it's all ‑‑ does anybody in here program in C++? Yeah, you'd be able to easily modify it and uh, I do have some ‑‑ a little bit of DLL errors and stuff that are getting worked out so ‑‑ but I am going to release it here soon so ‑‑ yes? Oh, for some of the post requests and stuff like that? Yeah, a lot of them, that's what I'm saying, a lot of the IDSs already do block post requests, stuff like that. That's why the malwares dump them locally or they have actual uh, other ways of exfiltrating. I was just going over a lot of the main ones. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep, tell that to the last Fortune 50 companies that got breached and it's like, I thought the same thing too. I was like, there's no way that, you know, but yeah, it happens every day and a lot of people, they do, like it's one of the things of the original IDS is it gives too many emails, too many red flags on some of the stuff where it's just like how do you tell what's real at the end of the day? So does that answer your question? Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of been ignored by a lot of the industry and stuff like that. So then, yeah, I understand that some of them do have uh, VLANs and they have other systems that are in place that do work, most work. Some of them they have to actually you know, there are other steps that people have to take to actually breach their point of sale systems. Some of the point of sale install implementations I've seen the last two years are ridiculous and they are doing a very good job at it. But I, it, once again, it's, you know, the mom and pop shops can't afford it or some of the smaller point of sale ones. So, is there any other questions? Yes. Well, one of the main systems, I did go into some embedded systems. Uh, so I've tried it on a Windows uh, based point of sale systems. So Windows 7, Windows XP, uh, some of the older ones, uh, some of the embedded ones. And what was the question again? How it actually. Yeah. It doesn't interfere with all the ones I, I can't, I can't go into detail. I don't program the point of sale systems, but it, I don't know. It just injects it into memory. So it's after the fact of where it would have gotten dumped. So when it's taken, that's the point it's taken is before it's ‑‑ some of the end to end encryption stuff, like that's, that's where it would lose it at. So it's, it's, yeah. I hope, does that answer your question or? Okay. Yeah, not a problem at all. So what was your question? Uh, every single one of them on that list, which, uh, which was the big breaches, they have gone. I've literally tested and, so yeah, it's something that a lot of those they do literally just go through memory and even ‑‑ yeah, you select the process ID that you put it into. So like you can actually put the, the process ID for your actual point of sale system. 
So that's what I'm saying. It can inject it directly into the memory of the point of sale systems, even if they have some hardened and embedded stuff. That's where the malware looks for it. At this time, they literally scrape all the memory. The, the point of sales, if you guys have ever reverse engineered an actual point of sales malware, it is very, 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 very simple in most cases and very, very uh, not resource intensive. So, so does that answer your question? So, and I would love to talk to you guys afterwards. I, I love constructive criticism. So, <laughs> so, yes. Like, yeah, not, not, none of the near field stuff. I haven't tested any of that. I don't have the, the money uh, to actually buy some of that stuff. So, because some of those systems to do a proper implementation, you need the back end server stuff and uh, you need time servers. There's lots of setup for it. And it's just something I didn't take the time to learn. And it's something that I have not had the uh, privilege of testing, you know, an environment like that. But I, I see no reason at all if it's, if it's being ripped to uh, credit card data yeah, that would pass one of the algorithms or the search algorithms for the malware. There's no reason at all that you couldn't inject that data with it. So. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and that's something, that's why I talked about the evolution. I know this is very simple, but the malware skimmers that are out there are very simple right now. And that's why that next step is injecting that data. I know some of them obfuscate the code into another valid looking credit card number. There's tons of other methods. But this is literally just to cover the last, you know, five years where people are still using some of the first generation Dexter, the Jack POS I've actually seen. It's, it's just ridiculous that these uh, malwares should be able to creep through memory and still steal credit card data. So. And that's kind of what I was trying to stop is the brunt force of it and get that, that concept out there because it, it's, it's open source. I'm not trying to make money. I'm not trying to pitch any software. It's something where I want the vendors to actually implement that. So does that answer your question? Okay. I think I have, do I have time for one more question? Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, just the nature of the point of sale systems. So, and just computers in general, there's a lot of things that stay resonant in memory until the actual power, it's powered off. So, and there are ways though, there are a couple of uh, uh, point of sale systems where they dump memory at certain times and things like that. I did come across some of that, but nothing uh, to the level. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, uh, you guys are coming up with the exact same reasons. I was like, why don't people do this or that? And that's kind of why I did this talk this year, because I wanted people to get that proof of concept out there. So, yeah. So, any other questions? Sweet. Well, thanks. I really do appreciate your time, and I, I would love. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>